Okay, shall we pray first, and then I'll, I'll share. Father, we want to acknowledge your word here this morning. Your word declares that you are God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. God, your word is living, it is powerful, it is active. And so, Father, we just acknowledge this morning that we partake of your word, for man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth, Father. And so, Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would anoint the vessel, that the vessel would speak your word, and that we would receive your word from your throne this morning. There would be life to our spirits. Lord, that our minds would be renewed thereby, for our minds do need to be renewed, Father. We acknowledge this. And so, Father, we ask in Jesus' name that your word would just work within us as you've designed us to operate. We thank you for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Guys, the word of God is extremely powerful. Uh, the Tongue's interpretation, where's Tubus? I don't know. The, the, the interpretation this morning, uh, very... When we get a word from the Lord prophetically, very often we hear it and it's part of the service and we move on. But we don't quite often take it as what it is, a word from God. When the Holy Spirit speaks through prophetic word, it's the Holy Spirit who is speaking. And so he's having his say in the meeting. And so quite often we hear a prophetic word given. We say, oh, okay, that's a great thing. But think about it and think of what the Holy Spirit is emphasizing at that particular point in time. And what he was emphasizing this morning is that there's reality out there. But there's truth. There's a higher truth. And God's word is that truth. Jesus said, my word is truth. And so the, the higher truth is what we look to in this life, to walk in. Jesus, when he went to go raise the, the young girl from the dead, she was dead. But Jesus said, no, she's not dead. She's sleeping. Why is that? Because Jesus understands life a little bit more intimately than what we do. She was sleeping. For those who die in Christ, fall asleep. And so the Lord just pulled the spirit back. And he raised it from the dead. And so there is a little bit more to uh, the reality that we face. And that little bit more is the word of God, which is in fact a lot more. Uh, show of hands. I, I did this last time I was ministering. I'm going to do it again. Can I have a, a show of hands of everybody in this room who is a son of God? All right, I'm going to set you guys up. So you're convinced you're sons of God. All right. Over the last 24 hours, which of you, sons of God, have knowingly committed sin? You've thought something wrong, you've spoken something wrong, you've done something wrong, and that you've known that you had to repent of that. Okay, so have I got the same kind of hands? Did everybody look around the room? Is it basically the same hands? Both hands up. <laughs> then answer that particular scripture. I, I have to read them out. Okay. I have a question. 1 John 3 8. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I've highlighted that particular part of the scripture that says, He who sins is of the devil. And so now we have a bit of a problem here because John has now thrown something out at us that is pretty contrary to what our understanding of the scriptures is. Am I correct? For we're all sons of God and we've all just admitted that we've all committed sin within the last 24 hours. And John says, okay, then you're not a son of God. You're a son of the devil. For you've committed sin. And so the church is now sitting with a bit of a quandary because now the church seems to say, says to itself, either John was on a little bit of a high here and he was not quoting from the Holy Spirit, or John got it right. And he was speaking from the Holy Spirit. And we as a church don't quite understand what's going on. And so I think the latter is what I'm going to be showing you today. The, the, the title of my message, How to Walk Free from Sin, 
is a very controversial, controversial message in, in, in the church. The church hates to hear that particular message. The church loves to hear the fact that we are all just what saved by grace. What is? Sinners. We're all just sinners saved by grace. Have you, anybody heard that before? No. It's a common, 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 common uh, statement in the church. And where do you think that statement came from? There's a, there's a, a little word there that says the devil. It comes directly from him. And there's a lot that is taught in the church that comes directly from the devil. And we as a church have got to get back to the Word of God, to a complete and clear understanding of God's Word, so that we can walk as our Lord has intended us to walk. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share this. The Lord gives me dreams every now and then. Um, in my younger days, the Lord gave me a couple of visions, but He gives me dreams, and in these dreams, Quite often the Lord is present. He's never appeared to me. I've never seen the Lord. I've just known His presence. This one particular, I just want to emphasize the Word of God and how important it is for us to know it, to understand it, and to spend time in it. I, I, I challenged some of you guys last time to read your Bibles. I trust that some of you have gone away and read your Bibles. Um, because you must also be careful that I don't preach from first imaginations and that others don't preach from first imaginations so that you can rightly divide word. Anyway, back to the dream. I was in an auditorium and I was listening to a Bible teacher and I was conscious of the Lord standing next to me. And I, I, I recall saying to the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm going to have to judge what this man says based on your word. And then what I said shocked me in my dream. I turned to the Lord and I said to him, I said, Lord, because even if you were to teach me something that was contrary to your word, I would challenge you on it. I would have to challenge you on it. I broke down in tears in my dream when I said that to the Lord. Because, and then I said, because Lord, if we do not have your word to guide us, we are completely vulnerable. And the moment I said that, the power of God hit me and I woke up in bed completely drenched in the anointing of God. And it just kind of emphasized again to me the fact that the Word of God is our anchor. Guys, we're going into the last days. That's going to happen. I don't know how many of us will be around when that actually does happen. But the Lord did say that in the last days there are going to be many miracles and signs and wonders performed by many false prophets. And they will be out there to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Guys, it's the Word of God that is going to get us through. It's knowing the Word of God. You know, when our Lord Jesus, and this is outside of the message, but I'm, I, I just feel a little bit of the Holy Spirit to just share with you the, the, the importance of God's Word and how we, we cannot neglect it. It's impossible. You cannot. You, 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 you're messing up if you do. When our Lord Jesus went to the cross, you know that He had absolutely nothing except the Word of God. He did not have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had left him in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he became sin, he who knew no sin was made to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had absolutely nothing. Go read the Psalms. He says, this is our Lord speaking, he says, If I didn't have your word, I would have succumbed. He, when, he, when the Lord went down into hell to pay for our sin and incurred the wrath of the Almighty God because of our sin, and that ties in with this message, it's our sin that set him on that cross. It's our sin that sent him to hell. When he went down there, he had nothing except the Word of God. That's the only thing he had. He had no anointing. He had no presence of the Holy Spirit. He had nothing. He had the Word of God. He held on to the Word of God that said, You will not let my uh, flesh see corruption. And God raised him from the dead. I, we don't go through that. Because our God will never leave us nor forsake us. We, he went through that so that we don't have to. Amen. Okay? So we don't go through that. We have the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us. He was, he's, he's with us forever. Forever. He'll never leave us. I love the anointing of God. I love the anointing of God. 
The anointing has not left me since March 2013. I have been blessed by the Lord. Now guys, the, the, whole, the, the, the Word of God teaches us the Holy Spirit is given to us as a guarantee of our inheritance. When I came into the kingdom of God, uh, the Lord blessed me so abundantly. Really, I used to go into meetings and I used to walk into the very presence of God. The, the fra- anybody smelt the fragrance of God? The fragrance of heaven? Yes. I used, there you go. Thank you, Lord. There are, there are many others uh, 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 in meetings, the guys who raised their hands. I used to, you would walk into a meeting and it's like walking into a, a perfume factory, but I mean such a, a powerful, beautiful, and, and, you, and just drenched in the power of God. And it, it was just upon me and upon me and upon me. And I used to, I, I remember as a young Christian, I used to say to guys, you know, I can understand now why the disciples never sinned. They were just so in love with God. They were just so full of God. And I remember, ah, uh, Lord forgive me, older, more mature Christians saying to me, no, that's not right. You're going to sin. Don't think that you're not going to sin. That's not, you know, you know, everybody's going to sin. And so as a younger Christian, I kind of lost it. And I, and I did, I backslid you at my testimonies out there. But anyway, but since, since the Lord has revived, and since I've come back into fellowship with Him, he's, the anointing has returned in a different way. I, he's not he's allowed me to experience that anointing that I used to experience when I first, but my spirit burns continually. Sometimes it gets very uncomfortable. Uh, we were driving the other day in the car, my, I said to my wife, it, my spirit burning so hard, I, I, it, 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 it's, it's, it gets painful. But anyway, be that as it may, the anointing is such a blessing. And guys, the anointing comes upon us as we walk in the presence of the Lord, as we walk in fellowship with Him. And so what I'm wanting you guys to do today is to get a hold of the fact that each and every one of us are called to walk in the fellowship. John says, guys, I want you to have fellowship with us because our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. I want you to come into this place. So anyway, John comes up and he says, he who sins is of the devil. So how do we explain that, John? In the next part. Okay, well, I'm going to just explain by going to, yes, it's exactly the next part, but some other scriptures as well. But it's really our spirits are born again. Yeah. Our spirit is born again. You are a spirit. I shared this with you guys last time. We are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live inside a physical body. But it is your spirit man that is born again. And so when John says, he who sins is of the devil, he's talking about every single unbeliever out there. They are of the devil. And we used to be there. We used to be there. Okay? And that is why he can say quite confidently that if you sin, you're of the devil. Because he's talking about the spirit. Our spirit, your spirit, which is born again. Uh, scripture of 1 John 3, 9 says, whoever, John does go on to the next scripture, and he says, whoever has been born of God does not sin. Does not sin. Does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin. Because he has been born of God. Your spirit cannot sin. It cannot sin. It can not sin. Guys, get that into your thinking. Remember when we pray? We have to have our minds renewed. You have to start thinking in line with the Word of God. You who you are a spirit. If you were to drop down dead right now, to be absent from the body is to be present, present with the Lord. You will be in His presence immediately. Old Testament saints wouldn't. That couldn't happen to them because they were not born again. They had to go to a holding place that was called Abraham's bosom until the Lord went there and preached to them and then they got born again. And so when we come to the kingdom of God, we're born again. Our spirits are perfect. You cannot get your spirit to sin. I don't care how hard you try. It will not do it. Your spirit will not sin. You can kill your spirit. That you can do. There is a sin unto death. John taught on that too. John taught on a lot of controversial stuff that the church stays away from because it's hard to understand. But if you go into the Word of God, and we understand the Word of God, and we rightly divide the Word of God, it's quite easy to understand, actually. 
And so your spirit counts. And Peter kind of backs him up. He says in 1 Peter 2.23, he says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. The Word of God. Both John and, and, and Peter talk about the seed, the Word of God. And so your spirit, you have to get this understanding in you that your spirit will not sin. If you go commit sin, you're going to be convicted from two sources. Your conscience is going to really have a go at you and say, that's wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. And everybody has a conscience. Even the unbelievers have that. But your spirit will have a go at you as well. Go look at the book of Romans. It says the two combined, the, your conscience and your spirit will condemn you. And so when you're feeling condemned, because your spirit is saying, wait a minute, this is not me. I don't want to do this. Stop doing that. And so the condemnation comes from within. It doesn't come. God doesn't condemn. But your own spirit will. What did John say? If, if your heart doesn't condemn you, you have faith toward God. Talks about confidence, but it's actually talking about faith. And so if your heart's not condemning you, what, what does that mean? Think about it logically. The Bible's also logical, huh? Eh? So, your heart's not condemning you. What are you doing? Not You're not sinning. There you go. It's not, co- not complicated. It's quite easy when you get down to it. So when your heart is not condemning you, you're not sinning, you have confidence toward God, you can go and ask the Father anything. He'll give it to you. In His will, in His name. Alright, so I just say to you that you can kill your sin, your spirit. We won't go down that road today, but it's quite possible that we can kill. Your spirit will either be alive or dead. That's, that's, the, the, that's the nature of a spirit. The, the, remember our Lord said to uh, one of the, the guys, said, let me go bury my father. What did the Lord say? Let the dead bury the dead. So he's talking about everybody out there are dead. We were there too. We were all spiritually dead before we came into the kingdom of God. So a person's spirit is either alive or it's dead. One of the two. Now whatever, whatever position it's in, it takes on the nature of that position. And so that's why John says, He who sins is of the devil. Because they're spiritually dead, they take on the nature of their father. He said, you are of your father, the devil. Okay? They take on the nature of their father, the devil. He who is born of God, their spirit takes on the nature of our father, heavenly father, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, spiritually, you can either be alive or you can be spiritually dead. Your spirit cannot commit sin because the Holy Spirit dwells within your spirit. And the Holy Spirit cannot dwell with any, in any place where sin abides. For in Him there is no sin. There's no sin. There's no sin in Jesus. There's no sin in the Holy Spirit. So just get that clear in your mind that your spirit is completely pure before God. No matter how much sin you commit, by the way, your sin, your spirit does not get affected. Your spirit stays alive. For He has said what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. So it isn't a case of, alright, I'm committing sin, and so God steps out of me and goes up to heaven and says, alright, when you get back into fellowship with me, when you start living a good life again, I'll now come dwell within you again. It doesn't work like that. Holy Spirit comes in, He lives with us forever. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. And so our spirit, by the grace of God, by the blood of the Lamb, stays completely clean from sin at all times. Until such a time as the Christian gets a bit stupid and uh, we won't go down that road. Next, next scripture. Um, 1 Peter 2, 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. We've all heard this preached many times before, by whose stripes you were healed. And we claim that scripture. And, we, and when we get sick, we say, Lord, by your stripes I was healed. But we don't hear this preached too often that says that we have been died to sins. But Peter teaches it very clearly that we have died to sin. John backs him up, actually uh, Paul backs him up, he says in Romans chapter 6 verse 2, he says, Certainly not. How shall we, who died to sin, live any longer in it? 
And so both of these apostles both teach the same gospel. I think I shared with you guys, if you go study the two gospels that they both preach, they're almost identical. Paul, just a little bit more detail than what Peter does. But they, both these guys have come up with exactly the same teaching, that we have died to sin. And so you are dead to sin. The church is dead to sin. You have died. When you come into the kingdom of God, there are a number of things that have happened, and I shared this with you guys before. Besides being born again, one of the other things that happen is that the old man dies. That old man who was a sinful nature died. And so you have died to sin. Sin is not... There you go. There you go. Alright, so just to get back on track, because otherwise I ran out of time. Just to get back on track. So, we, your spirit cannot sin. You have died to sin. But we all put up our hands. We all sinned. And so why do most believers sin? One of the mo- one of th- there's three main reasons why believers sin. Okay, and the title of the message is How to Walk Free from Sin. So I'm going to try to point you in direction so that you can get out of this thing. One of them is ignorance. Most believers do not un- understand the fact that they have died to sin. They do not even know that they have died to sin. If you go talk to Jesus, he's going to tell you, you've died to sin. So why are you continuing in it? Alright, you go talk to the Holy Spirit, he's going to tell you, you died to sin. So why do you continue in it? And so it's ignorance, because it doesn't get preached. It's not a popular message, because the popular message is, God loves you. God's grace is upon you. God's favor is for you. Whatever you do, however much you mess up, God loves you. And the grace of God, you're under grace. You know that you're under grace? Everybody here, we all under grace? We all understand that we're under grace? Okay, we're going to blow that theory out of the water just a little bit. But we have all died to sin. And so ignorance is there because it doesn't get taught in the church. This particular gospel doesn't get taught. You've died to sin. You've got to get that into your mindset as well. Renewing of the mind. You have died to sin. You go try and get somebody who's died to something to do something, they can't because they're dead to it. And so you have died to sin. The other reason that uh, Christians sin is because of unbelief. Most believers, and I would imagine if we poll this room, and I'm not going to poll it now, but most believers are fully convinced and believe with all their hearts that they cannot not sin. Everybody believes, but we will sin. We're going to have to sin. When you go tell Christians, but you don't need to sin, they look at you kind of strange. Okay, this guy's really got lost it a little bit. But it's because of unbelief. You cannot, when you come into the kingdom of God, it's by faith. We, we, we shared that last time. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's by faith. You're not going to receive anything from God except by faith. It is all by faith. So if you go out of the starting block and you, your, your faith is saying to you, I must sin. I cannot not sin. My, I, I, guess what's going to happen? You're going to sin. It's by faith. It's by faith. You take that scripture and you say, Lord, I've died to sin. And he who has died has been freed from sin. And so, Lord, I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm going to take you at your word. Give us a word this morning. There's reality, and then there's the truth. And God's word is truth. And God's word says you've died to sin. You have to believe that. If you're going to live that, you have to first believe it. It's not going to happen any other way. God's not going to work in you any other way. Believe you me. You have to believe it. So firstly, it's ignorance that Christians don't understand the gospel. Secondly, it's because most Christians don't actually believe this word is true. That you've died to sin and that you cannot sin. So most Christians don't. This, well, this one is the biggest stumbling block. To get over that. But if you're going to walk in it, you're going to have to believe it. It's by faith. The just... The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just, those who are justified in Christ, shall live by faith. Guys, it's by faith. This whole walk of God is by faith. Nothing else. There's no works involved. We do things even.
that everything we do, we do by faith. Paul going one step further. What did he say? Anything not done by faith is what? Yeah. Jeez, how do you think how much we sin? Okay. There's a lot of sin out there. But you've got to, the starting block, in order to get out of the starting block, you have to believe it. Because if you believe it, and you start confessing it, and you start acting on it, be a doer of the Word of God, and not a hearer only. And you start saying, wait a minute, I'm not going to sin anymore. My Jesus died for my sin. You know, a lot of Christians look at, at what the Lord did on the cross from the point of view of, thank you Lord, you died so I can continue in sin. Eesh. No. He died for my sin. I've been washed clean of my sin. So don't continue in it. Because every sin you commit is a sin that he had to go to the cross for. So don't, you know, think about it. Think about if you're going to commit sin that, that your Lord had to actually pay for that sin. So don't do it, man. Just, just by faith start believing that uh, the, the Word of God is true and that you've died to sin. Another reason why Christians continue to sin. 1 Peter 2 verse 16 says, As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Paul kind of backs him up here. Paul says it in another way, but it's pretty much the same thing. In Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty... Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And so the grace gospel is preached to the extreme, especially at this point in time. God is restoring holiness to the church. It's going to happen. Some of the, some of the, the, the Christians are going to come in kicking and screaming because they don't like it, but it's going to happen. The flesh doesn't like it. The flesh does not like a message that says you've actually got to live right. The flesh likes a message that says God forgives me no matter what I do, and he does. All right? But that's no excuse to go live that way. And so what was happening in Paul and Peter's time is that people had got a hold of this message and even distorted it. Um, some of the guys were preaching uh, that you actually need to, in, in Paul, in Romans, he says, some guys have actually got hold of this message of grace and said, guys, we need to be sinning more so that grace may abound. And so that we, there was a teaching out there that we said, you actually have to go out there and you have to commit as much sin as possible so that the grace of God, let us do evil that good might come. And so that is the, 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 that particular teaching will come back into the church as well, by the way, because of the grace message that is out there. But people take this grace message and Paul says, don't use it as an excuse. Don't use it, okay, I'm under grace, I'm not under the law. I'm not under, I don't have to, uh, do, don't, don't come and preach to me about don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Because I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. And guys, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Paul and Peter are saying to you, don't use it as an excuse, this grace message. The grace message is what? The grace message is, you've been saved by grace. And so now, by my grace, live for me. Live for, for the, 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 the holiness of God. Be ye, what? Because I, be ye holy, because I'm holy. And now, God hasn't changed being holy. And so he expects us to be holy. And he gives us the grace to do it. And so that what, that's what grace is all about. And yes, when we do mess up, God's grace is there. And so there's no condemnation from that point of view. But what I'm trying to say is, is that, guys, there is a, a distortion of the message of grace. Um, and so how do we get to walk free from sin? Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do we walk in the Spirit? We walk in the Spirit by faith. How many have seen your spirits? I look in the mirror, I can't see my spirit. I haven't seen it. I don't know what it looks like. I do know that it's light. The Bible tells me it's light. But I've not seen my spirit. But we get taught to walk in that spirit. That is, capital S is actually talking about small s, our spirit. Because your own spirit, it dwells within the Holy Spirit. And so we do this by faith. But 
there's some practical steps that we do as well. Romans chapter 8 verse 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. And so the carnal mind says, uh-uh, can't do this, need to live like I've always lived, in the reality that I've always been exposed to. And the, the, that's not a spiritual mind. And the carnal mind will argue with God. And the carnal mind will say, yes, I know that's what your word says, but... Always got the butt in there. And so the carnal mind has got to be renewed. You have to start thinking as Jesus thinks. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter, chapter 6 verse 11. He says, Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so it's a mindset that you have to get changed. Reckon yourself. Think about it. Think about it logically, guys. You've been born again. You're a son of the Most High God. Your spirit wants to live. You know, it's difficult to demonstrate, but you've got your spirit here, your flesh, your, your body here, and the soul is here. And so the spirit, born again, wants to live for God. That's it. He, he sold out to God. He only wants God, 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 more God, lots of God, no more. Oh, just give me God, thank you. Okay, flesh, body, says, wait a minute, hamburgers, that's nice. Cakes are nice. All sorts, of, I don't want to go down the road of sin, but there's all sorts of weird stuff that the flesh loves and wants to continue down that road. And so now the soul is in the middle. Because your soul is your mind. Your mind, what you think on will determine how you behave. Okay? What you set your mind on will determine how you think, how you behave, how you act. And so that's why we renew our mind. Because our mind used to always think in that direction. With the body, wanting to go boom, down there. Now, the mind has got to be renewed to start thinking, wait a minute, this guy's got it right. This is where I should be going. And this is the way I should be walking. And the way we renew this mind is through this word of God. We think about his word. You know, Jesus said, your word is my meditation all the day. Yep. Jesus never stopped thinking about the word of God. Believe me, if you, keep, if you take on that mindset, um, more and more people I'm speaking to, God is dealing with them. And they're starting to just want to think about the word of God. And that's the Holy Spirit. He's doing that in the earth at the moment. And that's what's going to happen. And as you do that, as you're thinking about and meditating on the word of God, you know what? You're not going to think about all that other rubbish. The stuff that, that is against God. Because bringing every thought, every thought, not only a few of the thoughts on some time of the day, but every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ Jesus our Lord. So it, it, it's a disciplined lifestyle. Initially it is, because remember, you come into the kingdom of God, we're all carnally minded when we come into the kingdom of God. None of us come in spiritually mature. And so we have to renew our minds. And so it takes time. And the carnal mind is going to rebel against it. For the carnal mind is enmity against God. It doesn't want God. It doesn't want to do this. Because this is not what it's been taught to do. And it doesn't like this. And so we have to renew our minds. So it's a practical message from that point of view, guys. Romans 8.5 says, For those who live according to their flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And so what you think about will determine how you behave. Alright, so it's renewing your mind. It's taking a word of God and just meditating on that. And when anything you when you when you find yourself, you know what the Lord does to me these days? Even if even in my sleep, and last night it happened. Even in my sleep, if I dream about something that is contrary to the Word of God, He wakes me up, I repent of that, and I go back to sleep. Guys, because we have to become so saturated with, you know, you get to heaven. There's not going to be one single rugby match in heaven. I'm sorry for you guys. Okay? I used to love watching rugby. I, I'm not going to preach that you guys should stop watching TV. And all. all I'm trying to say to you is this guy over here, this spirit, is not interested in anything on this planet. He is not interested in anything on this planet. Our Lord, when he was on the earth, he said to the Father, Father, keep my eyes from looking at worthless things. And everything on this planet is worthless in comparison to heaven. 
all we should be interested in is doing the will of our Father and, and, and living as our God has called us to live. So is it possible to get to this utopia of living like that? Yeah, 100%, definitely. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4. This is Paul speaking. He says, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself. Yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. And so Paul got to the point where he was very com comfortable in his walk with God that he could comfortably say, I don't know of anything against you guys. I searched my conscience. He, time and time again, Paul would say, I've lived my life in all good conscience before God and men. Paul lived a life sold out for God. And so he gets to the place, he says, I don't have anything against myself. But he said, well, but don't get hung up about that. Because even though I don't know anything against myself, the Lord's my judge. And he will sort me out for anything that I've done wrong. Okay? So don't go down that route that we are absolutely perfect. Because even Paul saying, when I don't know anything, he said, I honestly don't know, guys. I, I checked my, my, my prayer closet this morning. I, I was kneeling before the Father. I said, Lord, highlight any sin. And the Lord said, sorry, Paul, you've come up clean. I can't highlight anything for you. So he said, I, actually, I walked out of my prayer closet and I don't know of anything against myself. But that's not meaning that there isn't anything against myself. My Lord's my judge. Okay, so get it into context. But what I want to get to you across is that Paul got to the place where he could say that comfortably. He said, guys, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul put, him out, put himself out there. He said, guys, if you really want to see how to, what it's like to live like Jesus, have a look at me. You look at me, and then you'll have an idea what it's like to live like Jesus. And God let him write that in the, in the scripture. Holy Spirit gave him that inspiration to write that. And so, there is a place that we can get to. Um, but he, he, you know, he, he, it was a growing process, and let me just finish off nearly there. It was a growing process, um, because... Oh, sorry, 1 Timothy 1.15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And so Paul is saying, guys, I came into the kingdom of God, I was the worst of sinners. Uh, because I was, the, I was the guy that was out to destroy the church. And God, in context he's saying, God has used me as the example to show you his long suffering, his grace. Because he took me from where I was to where I am now. And so he's saying the transition was there. But if you go study Paul's writings in, in, in Romans again, when he was a baby Christian, he struggled with it. All right? he, used to, he said, guys, he, said, he, he went to the Father, he said, you know, after the inward man, I want to do what's right. But I find myself doing things that are wrong. So how does it work? You see, Paul was somebody who would inquire of God, and God then revealed to him and showed him about the fact that there is such a thing as the flesh and the spirit and the soul. All right. Before that, Paul was in a quandary. He didn't quite understand it. He, you know, he had this burning to do what God wanted, and yet he was still committing sin. And so Paul realized, he said, as a carnal Christian, he calls carnal Christians baby Christians. As a baby Christian, he had this problem. But he said, but thank God, in Christ Jesus, um, he'd been set free from that. He, he learned the lesson that he had died to sin, and so he walked in the reality of that. I know nothing of, of nothing against myself. And then we get to the, the, the last scripture, just to put it into perspective, which is 1 John 1, 8 to 10 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, and this is a scripture that every Christian knows very well, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And so here we go with John again, throwing two complete different pictures out there. He says, if you sin, you're of the devil. He says, if you, if you, if, if you don't sin, you're a liar, if you say you haven't sinned. So, John, how do we get this balance right? Please explain it to us. And John didn't explain it. He just ended it there. 
Yeah, so we'll go look at the scripture. He says here, in John 1, 7, he says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, talking about Jesus, if we're walking in the light as Jesus is in the light, remember what uh, John invited us into was fellowship. We have fellowship with one another, and this is a very important scripture. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay, so now what does that scripture mean? So as, as I am committing adultery, is the blood of Christ cleansing me from that sin? Anybody want to give me an answer on that one? No, I need to confess it. Ah, thank you very much. We have a Bible uh, teacher over there who knows his scripture. God's not, the blood of Christ is not cleansing you from that sin. As you are committing adultery, the blood of Christ is not cleansing you of that sin. That is a different kind of sin. And this is where you have to understand where Paul, where John, no, 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 listen to me. Okay. You have to understand John's teaching. Alright? Because, let's go to sin is sin. Let's go to the Old Testament. And at the Old Testament, what happened? The, the sacrifice for sin was offered how many times during the year? Anybody answer? Once. Can I have a show of hands? How many times a year was the sacrifice of sin offered for? Once. I've got two, what, two people that say once. You say once. Let's have a look at scriptures. Hebrews 9, 7. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year. Okay, so we're pretty much in time in line with what these two have said. But let's go on. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in finish it now. Ignorance. Committed in ignorance. That once a year was for sin committed in ignorance. It was not for sin committed knowingly during the year. There was a sacrifice for sin that if you had knowingly committed sin during the year, you went and you offered your sacrifice and you were forgiven and you were cleansed. The sin that was cleansed once a year was the sin of ignorance. I know of nothing against myself, but that doesn't clear me. God is my judge. And so the sin that is cleansing us from all, the blood that is cleansing us from all sin continuously, that the scripture talks about continuously, he is cleansing us from all unintentional sin, sin committed in ignorance, because we all, James says, we all stumble in many things. And so we are all sinning all the time. We, we quoted a scripture that said, anything not done by faith, is sin. Okay, so there's lots that we sin against. Guys, there's, there's, God is so holy, so pure, that there's absolutely nothing that comes close to being his, in His presence. So I don't care how holy a life we live on this earth, we don't cut it. That we don't get there. Because there's just too much sin. But the blood of Jesus cleanses us continually from that sin. Otherwise we can't have fellowship with Him. He cannot fellowship with sin. For in Him is no sin. And so what happens is, the, that's another message of grace right there. As we go in through life and we commit sin, and we do, and we commit sin unintentionally, and we commit sin in ignorance, the grace of God, the blood of Jesus, is constantly cleansing us from all of that sin all the time. So that we can walk in fellowship with God all the time. No, in, no, no in sin is different. So when you're committing adultery, don't rely on that scripture. You have to repent. And you have to ask for forgiveness. And then he will be faithful and just to forgive you your sin. Alright, so I think I've kind of put out the scriptures for you today, giving you some guys some things to think about. Um, but you, as I say, if, you, if you're not going to take this by faith, if you're not going to actually get out of the starting block and say, Lord, I'm not going to sin anymore. I've died to sin because I'm 
freed from sin. You, you took my sin upon you. And my spirit doesn't sin. And I'm not going to sin anymore. Because I'm born of you. I cannot sin. I won't sin. I'm not going to sin anymore. Believe you me. As you do that. The grace of God. The power of God. Will walk, work, work in your life. And it will transform you. You will stop sinning. You will start doing. It will become difficult for you. To, do, to say things you used to say. It will become difficult for you. To think about things you used to think about. And it's a progressive thing. Because we all come into the kingdom of God as babies. And so, God understands where we are. Alright? And so, He doesn't expect a baby to walk like a mature Christian. So, there's another aspect to this as well, guys. The mature Christian, God holds you more accountable than the baby Christian. Baby Christians can get away with things that a mature Christian, God won't let you get away with anymore. God says, no, no, no. You, you should be grown up a bit by now. I'm not going to let... That which I used to let pass over because you were a young Christian, you didn't understand any better. Now I'm going to say, no, no, no. This is now a known sin. This is now a known sin. Now you have to come and confess and repent if you want to get back into fellowship with me. Alright? Thank you, Lord.